Hello and welcome to ID Talk, answers from an infectious disease expert. I'm Dr. Sean Elliott, a pediatric infectious disease specialist with Tucson Medical Center, professor emeritus of pediatrics at the University of Arizona College of Medicine, and leader at the Arizona chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. This podcast has been created to answer questions from our chapter's members about the COVID-19 pandemic. And this week, again, we have some fantastic questions. This is the week of November 16th in the year 2020. Globally, there are 55.5 million cases recorded of COVID-19 and 1.3 million deaths. In the United States alone, uh, 11.3 million cases, and we have 248,227 deaths. Of those cases, 1.04 million cases are in pediatric patients. So we have crossed the million mile marker uh, for for children with COVID-19 that accounts for just over 11.5% of the total cases. In Arizona, uh, as of uh, November 12th, uh, we have 38,649 cases, which represents 14.6% of the total cases of COVID-19 in the state. Uh, We hold steady at nine recorded deaths uh, specific to COVID-19 or its complications. So obviously, I think we've all seen the news media, um, the cases countrywide and also in Arizona are on the upswing. We are absolutely, at least in Arizona, um, starting our third surge. Uh, the parts of the country are also experiencing a surge as well. Likely in the rest of the country, this is due to cold, dry air, which we know increases the transmissibility of coronaviruses in general and specifically the SARS coronavirus 2. In Arizona, there are probably uh, a, a expected uh, multiple number of factors, including uh, COVID fatigue and COVID angst uh, slash anger, in which patients are, are uh, not wearing their masks as frequently. Uh, and, and also, we, we are starting to get into some climate uh, changes, which may affect the, in, uh, the increase in the numbers of cases. To the questions, uh, a fair number uh, having to do with coronavirus vaccination, which again is a, a, uh, a welcome uh, series of questions, knowing what the news media have been releasing. The first is when, and I will say not if, but when a coronavirus vaccination is available, um, do we know how long immunity persists and if a yearly vaccination is going to be uh, necessary? Well, it, it, it's too early to tell right now. Um, the two studies in the United States, which have turned in uh, their efficacy rates, that being Pfizer uh, with 90% efficacy and Moderna putting in just as of yesterday, a 94.5% efficacy rate. Uh, These are preliminary estimates based on the first pre-identified data evaluation or data analysis cutoff. Both studies are intended to last over two years, which will be necessary to determine how long the immunity lasts. However, the the percent uh, efficacy or the protection rate from both these vaccines and and of other vaccines worldwide, and and here I'm thinking of Sputnik V coming from Russia, which triggered a 92% efficacy rate. It seems that creating a response to the spike protein, which is what all the vaccines are doing, is creating a significant and robust response, which which is wonderful. How long that lasts really depends on not just antibody formation, but but also on immortalization of of the cellular immunity, the the T cells, and then ultimately the B cells, the B lymphocytes, which will continue to produce uh, a a cohort of those antibodies. There is hope that the vaccines will produce a protective response, not just against getting disease, but also against getting severe disease. And that is based on those few patients that have been confirmed to have second infections with a mutant strain of the SARS-CoV-2. Those patients almost universally had a much milder case or even an asymptomatic case in their their second time around, which would suggest that the immunity is is definitely protective. But uh, we we truly, we mean in the scientific community, really has no data on which to predict how long the immunity might last. If it is short-lived, and I I think it's likely to be much longer than that, but if it is short-lived, then just like we experienced with influenza vaccination, uh, we will be looking at annual vaccinations for some time. And then the question will become, can we vaccinate sufficiently effectively uh, to create a herd immunity which will remove SARS-CoV-2 from the circulating viral experience of people around the world? 
If so, then great. We're, we're uh, maybe a couple years of annual vaccination and done versus uh, in the case of influenza, which has created a seasonal pattern which shifts from southern to northern hemisphere and, and which will indeed precipitate an ongoing annual uh, uh, vaccination response. I wish I could give us an answer, folks, but we're, we're just not anywhere near long enough in our experience to, to try and answer those. What are uh, the, the vaccine efficacies? Well, I've just shared those with you. Um, and, and my thoughts about them is, yay, fantastic, great. I, I, I guess uh, I, I've, I've uh, never seen Dr. Fauci, the great Dr. Fauci, look quite as animated uh, as when he was talking about both of the messenger RNA vaccine uh, stated efficacy rates. There's definitely hope for the future and, and proof of concept for all the other vaccine products out there. The real challenges, I think, will become in terms of delivery. Um, the Pfizer vaccine requires uh, storage at minus 90 degrees Fahrenheit, which is uh, even colder than a typical laboratory freezer, which is a minus 80. So such apparatus is going to require tooling up by, by uh, probably hospitals or larger medical infrastructure that, that is going to be able to afford that, that kind of uh, freezing or refrigeration versus uh, some suggestion that the Moderna uh, vaccine is stable at, at warmer temperatures than that and may even be stable for up to 30 days at refrigerator temperatures. All of this is, is very much via media release. The data is not published for sure, uh, nor, nor is it actually released in a peer-reviewed fashion. So take all of this with, with a huge rock of salt. But all that said, I, I think we, we can uh, this week, far more so than two weeks ago, have some hope of a vaccine intervention which may help us out. What about uh, the nasal uh, vaccines and, and nasal antivirals? And, and there's several different products out there which we, we need to distinguish. The first to discuss is a nasal uh, spike protein vaccine. Um, and actually it's not spike protein, it's an attenuated virus. So it's actually the SARS coronavirus 2, which has been passaged to the point where it is hopefully not virulent and hopefully not pathogenic. That virus is being created and, and being tested in China. Um, and it makes sense, right? So, so the, the primary mode of acquisition for uh, SARS-CoV-2 is via nasal epithelium and, and via the respiratory epithelium in general. So a vaccine which triggers and creates a localized immune response on the way to creating a systemic and fixed memory response um, should be, if anything, more protective or at least equally protective and easier to give than an injected messenger RNA vaccine or one of the replication deficient adenoviral vector vaccines. So that, that's the China product. In the United Kingdom, um, there is another product um, which is an, a, a uh, basically an opsonized trigger of innate immunity. So it's a nasal spray, which one would, would spray um, on, a, on a scheduled basis, maybe once a month, maybe once a week, yet to be determined. Uh, and it upregulates the human innate immunity, by which I mean uh, neutrophils, uh, other uh, phagocytes, so monocytes, um, and perhaps even activates some local complement, which can opsonize any virus uh, or viral antigen, which is binding to nasal epithelium. So that's cool. It's not really a vaccine, but more of a, a, an antiviral trigger. And it's not specific to SARS coronavirus 2, but to any respiratory virus or any respiratory pathogen, um, which would first bind to respiratory epithelium within the nose. That's pretty nifty. And I'm waiting to see what the results are of, of the longer term trials, um, which are currently in progress in the United Kingdom. Uh, then we turn to a similar product, which has just been tested in ferrets, um, also a nasal spray, uh, and, and also one with, which upregulates uh, local inflammatory mediators to prevent binding of the virus to the nasal epithelium. Similar products being tested, not just in ferrets, but also in early human trials in uh, this country, uh, and specifically at Columbia University, a couple others globally. How effective would these be? The, the initial numbers are, are quite striking. Uh, no way of knowing if they will be as effective as the messenger RNA vaccines, which we already know about, the, the Pfizer and the Moderna. But it certainly makes a lot of sense and a much easier to administer uh, product, both in terms of refrigeration needs, as well as being a, a nasal spray versus an injection. 
So I, I think uh, both adults and children would be successful candidates for the nasal sprays. There's no reason why a child would have a less effective response because we're not relying on a mature immune system for any of these to have a, a major response. So fingers crossed that that uh, further work continues robustly uh, on the nasal intervention, medications, vaccines, whichever you want to call it, but th those are in progress. Some additional questions, um, uh, I guess, about the difference in disease being seen with, with children and adolescents, and, and a specific question, why are children less likely to be infected with the coronavirus compared to adults? And similarly, um, adolescents, do they have more virus in the passages, but why do we not see more symptomatic disease? And, and here again, uh, it's probably a mixture of factors. In part, there, there is a, a, a spectrum of disease associated with COVID-19 uh, at the milder or asymptomatic end of which are factors associated with the viral infection itself. So virus binds to an ACE2 receptor in whatever tissue it binds to, it creates a local immune response against and only against that infected cell, um, and, and that triggers the symptoms which we know. So mild fevers, myalgias, flu-like illness, loss of appetite, the anosmia, the loss of sense of, of uh, smell and taste, likely due to neurotropism, the virus binding to, to uh, nerves which, which directly affect those senses. That's the milder end. Then as we cross into more and more severe or critical disease, uh, we now have to, to look at the impact of an uncontrolled or hyperimmune response, which is also triggered by the virus, but in this case, uh, sort of circumventing normal controller mechanisms and enrolling or causing release of inflammatory, pro-inflammatory cytokines. And here we're talking the interleukins, here we're talking interferons, here we're talking tumor necrosis factor alpha. And, and so, as a patient is younger, their, their response in creating a hyperimmune reaction is probably less sophisticated and thus less likely to create a robust response to the infection. So, so children and, and even some adolescents will likely be on the milder or asymptomatic end of that spectrum. On the other hand, older adolescents should be nearing maturity or well past maturity for their immune response. And, and yet we're not seeing a significant number of severe COVID-19 cases in adolescents. On the other hand, let's not forget about MISCI, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, which has been almost uniquely uh, reported in older age groups. So, so those older, I'm sorry, older age groups of children, children, adolescents, young adults. Um, so those are the individuals with that intact, mature, robust immune response triggered by virus to cause an autoimmune type or a hyperimmune response, creating the symptoms and in some cases the, the deaths uh, of, of MISCI. So this is, this is kind of a hand-waving answer to an important question. It largely has to do with, with uh, the children's immune response in terms of initial symptom response. Now, there is also evidence that children are less likely to bind significant numbers of SARS coronavirus 2, and, and, and this factor probably affects in an increasing age spectrum adolescence as well. This has to do not with the viral mechanics, but with the expression of ACE2 at target cells, uh, epithelial cells. Younger humans express less ACE2, a, uh, acetylcholinesterase and, uh, receptor 2, and thus will bind less virus. Um, and then there's a, a third component, which may be competitive inhibition of SARS coronavirus 2 binding by other respiratory viruses. We all know, of course, that, that uh, our lovely pediatric patients are, are virtual cesspools of respiratory pathogens, especially come the, the, the cold or drier months. Those viruses are all competing for binding sites um, and, and just access to the respiratory tree. So there is a suggestion, hypothetical at this point, that, that children are less likely to demonstrate disease and or infection with SARS coronavirus 2 because different immune response, different receptor expression, and, and, and potentially competitive inhibition by other respiratory pathogens. Um, all righty, let's see here. Um, next set of questions um, is, is turning now to the office setting and, and some infection prevention questions. Um, the first uh, is a return to a question about portable HEPA filters. Are they a worthwhile investment for clinic rooms for sick visits? Um, 
boy, th this is one of those difficult to answer because we don't know the, the true return on investment. The most effective mechanism of infection prevention in, a, we'll, we'll call it a, a, a dirty procedure room, like where an aerosol might be generated, is going to be air exchanges uh, with exhausting of the air exchange to the outside. So the, the negative airflow room, if, if one has a clinic uh, and is blessed to have uh, a negative airflow room, that, that's the ideal location. However, a HEPA filter is, is going to be recirculating the air and it's going to be decreasing by a certain quota or a, a concentration gradient, the amount of circulating virus each time it processes the air volume. That's not rapid, it's not 100% removal, so it, it likely helps, but it's nowhere near as protective. Now, in the vast majority of our clinic spaces, we're not blessed to have a negative airflow room. Um, and so there, um, purchasing a HEPA filter, um, which is reasonably good at air exchanges and has a very good micron size, is going to provide some benefit. However, I, I, would, I would stop from, from recommending that as a protective intervention and certainly would not use that as an excuse uh, to avoid other appropriate PPE. So I, I think it would simply be a if I can afford the dollar cost for a HEPA filter, it's going to, to increase by a slight margin the safety of my clinic space, but I and my staff absolutely still need to continue to wear uh, our protective masks, the N95s for uh, aerosol generating procedures, uh, the goggles, the protection of, of the, the eyes, etc. What about uh, universal healthcare facility temperature and question screening effectiveness? This has not been shown to be highly effective mostly because there are very few positive hits when doing the screening. Um, at my hospital, which is a you know 560 bed community hospital, temperature screens uh, were performed for the first several months of the outbreak. There were zero positives. There were zero hits. So, so rather than, than uh, temperature screening, the uh, standing symptom screening that, that all employees uh, and, and staff should know about is probably the more effective. If you develop one of the following, and here we can say fever, myalgias, loss of sense of smell, abdominal pain, dyspnea, uh, et cetera, et cetera, then stay home. Stay home, don't come to work, call in sick, and if possible, let's see if we can arrange uh, screening, uh, arrange some testing. So, so that I think is the more effective, or most effective way to go. And then a, a, a question, I, I love this one because we can all picture it, is a crying infant or screaming toddler potentially aerosolizing um, the virus? Oh my goodness, we can all just have PTSD together as we think about that, that screaming toddler in the waiting room with a whole bunch of other kids and parents looking aghast and in horror. Yeah, they're, they're aerosolizing something, and they may be aerosolizing sars coronavirus 2 but keep in mind that, that all of the population studies to date, and there's been a fair number of them, have not found the young age group, so here we're talking infants and toddlers, um, to be a high risk to transmit secondary cases of COVID-19. This, again, likely has to do with how effective they, they bind and release, or not, the virus, and, and what their viral load may be. So the, the, the short answer without giving, without being able to give you specific evidence of this scenario is, is that unlikely is the screaming toddler a major risk to aerosolize uh, transmissible virus. So yay, fantastic. That said, it'd still be great if maybe um, that, that particular toddler's parents could take them outside until they, they've recovered. Yeah, right. Okay, um, some additional series of questions, uh, and th these have to do with the use of, of cloth masks. And I, I'm going to interpret this question to mean, so those patient, oh, sorry, those staff members who are, are patient facing, so that they're the, the front office staff, perhaps the, the staff who are rooming, but they're not necessarily involved with direct patient uh, examination, giving vaccinations, participating in aerosol generating procedures. So, so those who are not directly exposed to, to either sick visits or, or aerosol generating procedures are, are probably, and here I'm saying probably in air quotes, probably okay with cloth masks. Keeping in mind that the major benefit of the mask is, is not to protect the wearer, but to protect the others around them. But there is some protective efficacy of wearing any sort of barrier, especially today's uh, new generation cloth masks, which have two or sometimes even three layers of fabric. 
So that certainly should be sufficient to prevent large droplets from the wearer of the mask. And unless they're saturated or dirty, uh, they will provide best estimates, uh, maybe 40% protective efficacy, efficacy to the wearer from others who may be coughing. So in, again, my hospital, I'm only sharing this because this may be an example of a large healthcare systems approach. All uh, hospital staff, and that's regardless of patient facing or not, uh, are expected to wear the surgical masks, mostly because the demonstrated efficacy both for protection to uh, and from the wearer uh, is, is known and, and is better than the cloth mask. There you go. I'm, I'm uh, not able to give you a direct answer as to whether it's safe or okay, because nothing we do is 100% safe or okay. We're trying to minimize or mitigate risk here. That there was a, a corollary to that question, which I completely agree with. Um, if there are parents or, or, or patients who come into the, the clinic space uh, wearing a valved mask, so th these are the ones where, where um, they, they, they exhale and there's a two-way valve, which allows the exhaled breath to exit the mask. Clearly, that, that's doing nothing uh, uh, for the purpose of the mask, and it, it's not the purpose or the intent of the mask to, to prevent transmission of the virus. So, so uh, in, in this particular question, such patients or parents wearing valved masks are asked to place a surgical mask, which they supply, over the outlet. That absolutely makes sense. So to sort of summarize the, this, I'm kind of all over the map with this question. Sorry about that. Just to summarize the response, the, the surgical loop masks um, and even the N95 or KN95 masks are the ideal protection for all of our healthcare personnel, regardless of patient direct facing, patient procedure facing or not. In those cases where for whatever reason, uh, one is running low on supplies, and I understand that's likely gonna be happening over the next couple weeks to a month or so, then for those, those staff or personnel who are not directly involved in patient care, yeah, they're facing the patients, yeah, they're facing the, 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 the parents, but they're not directly examining, vaccinating, aerosol generating. In those staff alone, a cloth mask may be adequate. Next one is a, a, a clinical vignette. Uh, so I'll, I'll, if you're permission, I'll, I'll read it here. So uh, if we're in the office and we have a patient with, with respiratory symptoms in their first five days, we have performed the, the SARS coronavirus 2 antigen testing and it's negative. And so far as we know that the, the child is not in a home with any known COVID-19 positive family members, would we recommend either retesting uh, via PCR, retesting via antigen, um, or just assuming that it's not COVID? Well, to answer this, I, I need to, to remind us that the, the current, currently available antigen tests, while expedient and useful and rapid and all those fabulous things, are nowhere near the sensitivity that we're anticipating or even the specificity that we're anticipating for PCR. So all the recommendations are, if you have a patient in whom you might suspect COVID-19 and the antigen test is negative, that patient must be considered a possible positive until we perform PCR testing. So the answer to this particular vignette is, toss out the negative result from the antigen, do the PCR test, and until then, isolate and consider that patient a possible or a, a suspect a patient with COVID-19. And then uh, a, a final question uh, regarding uh, specific aerosol generating procedures. And, and here we're looking at uh, nebulized bronchodilators uh, for our patients with, with asthma, with wheezing. Is it, is it required, is it necessary, or what, what's the evidence for? using a negative airflow room for an aerosol generating procedure like nebulized bronchodilator and then closing down that room for 30 minutes. Is that necessary? Or if one is in a clinic space giving a nebulized treatment and no negative airflow room is possible, do we then have to close down the room for 60 minutes? So the, the evidence in support of these numbers, and those are accurate numbers, by the way, 30 minutes for a, neg a known negative airflow room, 60 minutes for a, a normal room, those come to us from our surgical colleagues and more importantly from anesthesia colleagues using uh, operating, operating theaters that are known to have downdraft negative airflow air exchanges with, with more than 15 air exchanges per hour. In fact, the usual standard is, is upwards of 25 or 28. So even in those circumstances, there is still a 30 minute wait time 
to allow the room, the room time to clean out any potential persistent aerosol uh, containing SARS coronavirus 2. That's for a negative airflow room, 30 minutes for sure. 60 minutes is, is sort of based by mathematical modeling and on what we know from respiratory droplets and aerosol, the fine droplets, giving them time to settle down uh, onto uh, horizontal surfaces uh, and then be um, dried out and, and, and allow the, the virus to die. So that's where the guidelines come from. And uh, I'm not even sure that they're, they're, they're published in, in a COVID-specific uh, set of guidelines, uh, but more so from the surgical literature and, and from the anesthesiology literature. Yeah, that's a lot of time to add to the day. Others have, have taken those numbers and realized that it can absolutely impedes clinical flow uh, and throughput. Um, and some ha have tried or intended to do all their, their aerosol generating procedures, i.e. NEBS, outside. And certainly it, it's, it's getting to a much cooler time of year in lovely Arizona, current week notwithstanding, where it's hitting 92 degrees right now. Thank you. But as we get further into the winter and during this next surge of hours in Arizona, trying to do the NEBS outside, if at all possible, is one possible solution to free up clinic space inside. Uh, in the meantime, though, negative airflow rooms, 30 minutes downtime between an aerosol generating procedure, 60 minutes for a non-negative air airflow room. So that I think, I'm just looking through my, my list here, I think those are all the questions. Keep them coming, folks. This, this is great. Th thank you for listening. The ID Talk, um, Arizona AAP members can submit questions for future episodes to COVID, that's C-O-V-I-D, at azaap.org. Uh, and for more information and resources related to COVID-19 in Arizona, or to learn how to become a member, please visit us at azaap.org. Until then, hang in there, folks. I know it's scary out there. Um, everyone is in this together, and let's, let's all keep each other sane, safe, and passionate. So thanks for your attention. Hang in there, everyone. Thank you.